I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. If you haven't been with us, uh, we are studying through the book of Revelation, at least part of it. I'm eventually going to take a break from it as we get into the holiday season. Uh, But I, I just have to say something about this particular series. Of all the series that I've done in the years I've been at this church, I have never felt um, more spiritual um, oppression about preaching within this particular book. You know, the book of Revelation promises a blessing, and I almost get the sense that the enemy doesn't want the church to get the blessing. And so I... As I always pray before my messages, I'm going to be praying again today. But I'm just going to ask, would you please remember me in the weeks as well as I'm preparing these messages? Just about that whole spiritual intensity thing. Because I, I, I can't really explain it. But like, uh, you know, I'm, I try to be as open as I can. And I, I, there's been some nights where I just wake up and I have dark thoughts. I don't know why. Uh, and it just, there's just something around all this. I just feel like the devil just doesn't want people in the book of Revelation. I don't know what else to say. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray a hedge, Lord, a hedge of protection around us and around this message, Lord, because I really believe it needs to be preached. And I really believe, Father, that we need to find ourselves in this book that so many of us find very difficult to understand. And yet, Lord, we know there's truth here to be learned. And so, Lord, again, by the anointing of your spirit, take this time now, Father, and use it to all your honor and glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In case you haven't figured it out by now, I grew up in a family of storytellers. Come to one of our family gatherings. You will hear a lot of stories and a lot of laughter. One of my favorite memories is something that happened in 1998 when our family was leaving for the mission field. We boarded a jet heading off to Europe with at least 26 bags of luggage. Can you imagine showing up to the airport with that much luggage? Thankfully, the church helped us out with that. It was the first time for our children to ever be on a plane. And so when the captain was given the, gave us all, he was given the okay to take off. The thrust of the engines pushed us back into our seats, and our four-year-old at the time threw his hands up in the air so everyone could see and yelled, Wee! And now that he had everyone's attention, he shouted for the whole plane to hear, What happens if we crash? <laughs> what, a, what a way to go. Well, today we're going to, attempt to do what's next to the impossible with the book of Revelation. We're going to fly at breakneck speed above the clouds and into heaven. And hopefully we will not crash. In the previous messages, and I, again, I've been giving you a handout just to help you to follow along, just to remind you uh, that we had been looking in the section of the seven seals. The seven seals are that period of time that's referred to as the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation does not start until the middle of Daniel's uh, seven years. So at that midpoint where you have the abomination of desolation, according to Matthew 24, then the Bible, Jesus said, after that abomination of desolation, when you see that, that Daniel the prophet wrote about, then there will be a Great Tribulation. And as I tried to point out, the, the seals themselves correspond quite nicely to the events that happen within that season of the Great Tribulation. The first seal, it was that there would be a conqueror who would come. That conqueror, as we eventually uh, discover, it turns out to be the Antichrist, but that's not how the world sees him. The world sees him as, a, as really like a superhero. And the Lord Jesus also said that in that tribulation that peace would be taken, the second seal, the removal of peace, the third seal, economic calamity, and then that there would be death by sword, by famine, disease, and beast. And all that's described in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now, we've looked at that section in the past. 
And so where I want to pick up today is with this fifth seal, and eventually we're going to, we're going to really move forward within this text. Picking up at chapter 6, verse 9, John writes, the apostle John writes, and he broke the fifth seal. And I saw underneath the altar the souls who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. The, the, the Bible is telling us here that in that period of the great tribulation, there will be many people martyred. I don't know if you watched the news just this last week. It was, it was devastating. Did you hear about the, the 10 Christians that, that, were, that were killed by ISIS? I don't think this is old news, unless I was reading old news. But what struck me was that two of them were women. And, and before, they, before they beheaded them, they first raped them publicly. And then there was a teenage boy, who, a, a son of somebody who was in ministry. And, and he, had, he was given the opportunity to leave. They said to him, if you want, you can, you can go. But if you stay, we're going to ask you whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. And that young teenage boy stayed. And, and, they, and they killed him as well. There have been people who have been martyred for Jesus Christ for centuries. And, the, and here the Bible is telling us, that there will be martyrs as well in the future in that time known as the Great Tribulation. But there's something I need to point out. Did you hear that verse where they say, where these martyrs in heaven say what to God? They say, how long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou, will you refrain from judging and, av and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, do you know why that's, you know why that's such an important statement? If, if the martyrs are saying to God, and they're in the great tribulation, they're already into the second half of those seven years. If they're saying to God, how long until you begin to judge? Do you know what that implies? It implies that God's judgment hasn't started yet in those seven years. That's why I was trying to tell you, those seven years, you should not call them the tribulation. That's something people have thrown over the seven years. In the first three and a half years, the world's going to think it's on a honeymoon. It's not until the midpoint in those seven years when this superhero is revealed, at least in the eyes of those who are following Jesus, who studied their Bibles, who had pastors who preached the book of Revelation, are going to discover and say, you know what? There he is. But these people who are martyred are saying in the great tribulation to God, God, when are you going to start judging? Because it hadn't started yet. But then look what happens in verse 12. The sixth seal. And then I looked and I saw the he that broke the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who's able to stand? Now listen, I, I, I interpret Scripture by Scripture. In these events, the moon turns to blood. The sun is darkened. The stars are described as falling from the sky. There's mention even of a great earthquake. What was Jesus talking about in Matthew 24? He said that in the midst of that great tribulation, 
an unknown time would come because God will shorten those days. Why? Because if he doesn't shorten those days, whoever's following Jesus at that time is not going to be able to survive what's going to happen next. In Matthew 24, the moon turns to blood, the stars fall from the sky, the, the, the sun is darkened, there's an earthquake, there's a shaking in the heavens. But look what this does. In, in, the, in the fifth seal, we were taking a picture of the people up in heaven who've been martyred. But now we're zoomed down on earth. The ones up in heaven are saying, God, when are you going to start judging? And now the ones down the earth, the unsaved on the earth, what do they cry out? They cry out to the rocks, fall on us and hide, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and a great question, who's able to stand? Do you get it? Some, there's a shaking that happens here between the fifth and the sixth seal, where all of a sudden the people who are left on planet Earth realize that something's about to take place, and they describe it as God's wrath. It's going to come from the Father. And it's also called the Lamb's wrath as well. And that's a great question to ask. Who's going to be able to stand? Well, we're going to find out. Not many. In chapter 7, after this, John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And he said, don't harm the earth or the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Whew! Now, you say to me, what's this all about? Who, what's this 144,000? I can promise you one thing. It's not the Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's... It's those people who Daniel was given by God those 490 years with seven years remaining, and God said to Daniel what? This is for your people and your holy city, for Israel. Why does God seal these 144,000 Jews? For a very good reason. Because what's going to happen next is going to be so horrific if God hadn't placed his seal over these 143,000 Jews, they wouldn't have survived. You see, you remember back in the Old Testament times when Moses was about to lead the children out of Egypt? And finally it was going to come where God says, I'm going to send my angel of death. My angel of death is going to pass over Egypt and he's going to kill all the firstborn. You remember that? What were the Jews told to do? Take a lamb, shed its blood, and take the blood and put it on the mantle, put it over at, at the door of your house. Why? So that when the angel of death would come, in effect, he would see that blood. In effect, he would see God's seal over that household. There's a real good reason here because God now in this text is telling us that a day is coming where he is going to begin to turn back the hearts of the Jewish people and prepare the way for the coming Messiah. But he has to place this seal over them to protect them for the, from the horrible things that are taking, going to take place. Now, the interesting thing about Revelation is you see a scene in heaven, you see something going on in earth, sometimes then you go back to heaven, and that's what happens. Look at verse 9 in chapter 7. And then after these things I looked, and a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues, where did they come from? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
and all the angels are standing, were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And from where did they come? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and they've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, they're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd, and shall guide them to springs of the water of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, you might remember some weeks back, I shared with you the various uh, positions, viewpoints about where people have, people have been led differently to view where and when the rapture is going to take place. As you know, there are some people who are pre-tribulational. They believe that they'll be taken out before the seven years even start. There's others that are called mid-tribbers. They just believe they're taken out in the middle of the tribulation. There's others that believe they're not taken out to the very end of those seven years. And then there's that other view that I mentioned. It's called a pre-raph view that, that teaches that they're taken out at the end of the great tribulation before the start of God's wrath. And I also said, have your own convictions because we can all celebrate and agree together that Jesus is coming again. But in this particular passage, whoever these folk are, it's certainly more than just the nation of Israel in heaven. Because suddenly now, and this is the first time in Revelation, all of a sudden now, there are saved people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. That sounds an awful lot to me like the church. It sounds to me like there's a celebration service going on in heaven. Do you, do you begin to see what's taking place? God has placed a seal over these 144,000 Jews because he knows what's going to happen next. You have the unsaved, powerful people on the earth who realize that the Lamb's wrath, that God's wrath is now about to come. And prior to that, you had these martyrs in heaven who are saying to God, God, when are you going to start judging? And all this comes together, and now the people of God, whoever they are, and I believe if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll be among that crowd. What are they doing? Well, God is getting ready to unleash His fury on planet Earth. His bride is in heaven worshiping Him and giving Him all the glory. And in the seventh seal, terrible place to divide the chapter, the seventh seal is just one verse, chapter 8, verse 1. Look at it. And when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. You know what that's like? It's like the calm before the storm. It's that brief, eerie moment of standing in the eye of the hurricane. Do you remember when the hurricane came through, when it first passed through, and then all of a sudden things got quiet, didn't they? I remember going out in my backyard when that hurricane was passing over. This is like the calm before the storm. Do you see? The people of God are now in heaven. The people on the earth are, are in fear because they realize something's about to take place. And there's silence in heaven because God is about to judge the world. And I feel so moved in my spirit today. I asked Bill if he would come up. And in the midst of, of all this, just like with the heavenly host, just like when we will be in heaven with the Lord Jesus, I want us to all stand together. And I want us to sing holy, holy, holy. And then we'll look at the rest of these chapters. The traditional holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God. God 
free persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eyes of sinful men thy glory may not see. seated you see the people of God are worshiping in heaven there's this brief period of silence in heaven and then the trumpets begin to sound the seven trumpets these seven trumpets signal now that God's wrath has come and look at it in chapter 8 verse 2 the first trumpet and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them, and another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which are before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand, and the angel took the censer, and he filled it with the fire of the altar, and he threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And the first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the, grass, all the green grass was burned up. Let me tell you something. When you get to this part in the book of Revelation, you're not going to find Mary Poppins. There's no spoonful of sugar to make this medicine go down. And I can't candy coat this message. I just have to say this. There is going to be no sitting on the fence with God in those days. You are either in or you're out. And people say to me, you know, how, how can you even get into this section? This is all so depressing. No, it's not. Not if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can read these passages and say, praise God, I'm not going to be here because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the second angel sounded, verse 8, 
And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which are in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Do you remember Moses when he went out to the river Nile and he turned that river into blood? And death was spread throughout the land. Misery followed. Judgment has come. But, this is, but God is just warming up. Because the destruction continues in verse 10, the third trumpet. And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became wormwood, and many people, many men died from the waters because they were made bitter, which is really what the word wormwood means. It means bitter. Are you, are you beginning to, to sense now that when you move out of the great tribulation into the day of God's wrath, that things have changed? God is no longer holding back his judgment, but now he's unleashing his judgment. And you see this growing intensity, fire has blazed a third of the earth. A third of the seas smell like bloody death. And now a third of the fresh water supply is turned to blood. And people say to me, why are you taking us through this book? Because it's from this pulpit that we have preached the gospel for years, calling people to Jesus Christ because unsaved people need to hear the truth because God really is going to do this. This really is going to happen. And that's why God sent his son into the world. It's like the old hymn says, to rescue the perishing. I sincerely believe that one of the blessings of the book of Revelation is there might be an unsaved person who wanders into our sanctuary and realizes for the first time that God really does mean business and he really has provided the solution in Jesus Christ. And if you're that person today, I would call upon you. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. In verse 12, the fourth angel sounded. And a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were smitten. Now this is not Matthew 24 because it doesn't talk about a third. So that a third of them might be darkened and the day might not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. And I looked. And I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. A lot of people don't understand this stuff, maybe because they've never been taught. But you see, at the end of that great tribulation, when it's cut off by the Lord Jesus Christ and God's day of wrath begins his judgment begins and it falls on that day it's known as the day of the lord in the old testament in the book of job it tells us job tells us in joel, joel chapter 2 that the moon will turn to blood the sun will be darkened the stars will fall from the sky the heavens and the earth will be shaken and then the day of the lord will begin it's why when you read in first thessalonians 4 and 5 it's really the unsaved who are crying out because they realize they're in for it. And boy, are they ever in for it. It is a day of wrath. And look at the first woe in this first trumpet in chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bombless pit was given to him. And he opened the bombless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like smoke from a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And now the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots 
of many horses rushing to battle, and they have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. They have a king over them, the, king, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek his name is Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. And some of you might say to me, holy Batman, Pastor Dan, do you really think this is going to happen? What do you want me to say? Ah, no. God's just having a little bit of fun here. After all, he's just a big softy. But to that I say, perish the thought. I take God at his word. And let me tell you something. The butchery that has been done by some people in some books that are being written on the book of Revelation that try to read into these passages, try to, you know, come out, well, these must be Black Hawk helicopters that are shooting missiles. And no, no, this is demonic stuff. Do you get this? God releases this demonic angel who goes to this bombless pit. Where it is, I don't know, but we all know there's a spiritual realm, and, and God has, has these creatures prepared and ready, and they're going to be like locusts, but they're going to be unusual from locusts because they're capable of doing something that locusts don't do, and that is they're not going to go out and eat all the green stuff. Instead, they're going to have these terrible stingers that they're going to use, and, and whatever that is, and however that feels, it must be so nasty, and it's going to go on for five months. It's going to be so nasty, people will long to die. They would rather die. And do you notice, here's where the 144,000 show up? Because God says, well, but they won't touch those who have been sealed, because those are those Jews that God is protecting. You see, the thing of it is, is don't come to the book of Revelation and, and start, start doing stuff with Revelation that the Word of God doesn't do. And it was like a friend was telling me, he was teaching a Sunday school class, and he would get to a passage like this, and this lady was bringing all this other kind of stuff in, and he finally one day he said, he kept saying, I don't see that in the Bible, I don't see that, I just, I see what the Bible is saying, there they are. Where are you getting this from? She says, oh, I've, I've, I've been reading that in these books, this series that I have. And he said to her, and it was so classic of Mike, he said, don't you realize those books are just fiction? This is the Bible. And God is going to do this stuff. And the second woe comes in the sixth trumpet. In chapter 9, verse 13, the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which are before God. One sang to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, if they're bound angels, they're demon spirits. And so those four angels who had been prepared for that hour and day and month and year were released so that they might kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and this is how I saw them in the vision, the horses and those who sat upon them. The riders had breastplates, the color of fire, and hyacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of, the man, of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and they have heads, and with them they do harm. And the rest of mankind were not killed, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons, the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Now listen to me here. I'm just telling you. Don't find Black Hawk helicopters in this passage. Don't dilute the Word of God from what the Word of God is telling us. That, that God has some sort of army of 200 million prepared that are going to go out. And a third of the human race is going to be wiped off the map. People say to me, oh, Pastor Dan, you, you really, do you believe that? Do you believe that in Noah's day, when he and his boys were going out and they were sawing wood, they were bringing in all the lumber, and that took years for them to build that ark, didn't it? And I'm sure the people in the neighborhood probably came by and said to, said to Noah, that's the strangest looking house I've ever seen anyone build. You know, what are you doing? Why, why are you building this great boat, the ship, why, why are you doing this? And I can just imagine Noah saying to them, 
because God's judgment's coming. And I, and I could also imagine they probably laughed at Moses. They probably said, ah, come on, Moses. You've been drinking too much wine. What's wrong with you? This isn't going to happen. It's going to happen. You see, if God judged the world the first time by a flood, and he only saved one family, in this passage here, God at this point is only killing a third. He's done a lot more in the past. And I take this passage at face value. I take this passage and I say, you know what? When God begins to pour out his wrath, nobody's going to be debating, has God's judgment come? But do you see what has happened in the hearts of those who are left? When all this stuff is going down, they haven't believed in Jesus, and now they don't, even, they don't want to believe in him at all. They refuse to repent. And the Bible tells us that in the last days, those who are lost, their hearts are going to be darkened and hardened. They're not going to want to have anything to do with God. You know, I get people that have come in here and, and about this book of Revelation, and, and, as that, and I was tell, telling some of you that one weekend, a guy said to me, don't, let me know when you go back to the Gospel of Luke, because I don't like Revelation. Too bad. The Bible is from Genesis to Revelation. And those of us who have read chapters 21 and 22 know where the whole thing is heading. Because for us as believers, while we read about these horrific events, these judgments of God that are going to be poured out, we also know where God's taking the whole story, don't we? He's taking it to a beautiful end where there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is going to rule, where there's going to be no more tears and no more sorrows, where we won't even need the sun anymore. We can push it away because God will be its light. You see, for us, we might read these terrible passages and say, oh, these are horrible things, but we have the blessed hope because we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. There's a song that says, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound the song of saints on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till rest I've found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Canaan's tableland, a plain, a higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I never know who's going to be in this building Sunday to Sunday, especially in the summertime. But if you've come into this building today and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the bottom line is if you don't know Christ as your Savior and you die, what waits for you is eternal hell. But if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus as Savior, if you've been rescued by the Lamb of God, our promise is the hope of forever being with him on higher ground. Folks, all of us in this room have friends, neighbors, and relatives who don't know the Lord. The book of Revelation is for them as much as it is for us. Father, we know that day is going to come, Lord God, when you're going to pour out your wrath on earth. And it is going to be a terrible time, Lord. And I can only think, Father, really, that it must grieve your heart as it grieved your heart in Noah's day when you looked at the earth and you said, what has happened? Look what they've done to this beautiful world. And I thank you, Lord God, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that we have the blessed hope of our hearts of knowing that we're going to be with the Lord Jesus. But, Lord... Has someone come into this room today 
who has never trusted in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Father, is there someone here today that needs to flee to the cross of Calvary to repent of their sins and to believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior? And I just want to briefly ask with eyes closed and head bowed, is that you? Is there someone in the room today that today you would want this day to be your day of salvation? Would even right now you would trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior? If that's you, would you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? No one's looking around. But is there anyone in the room today, you're not prepared for what God has in store? Is there anyone? Lord, I truly do pray that everyone who has stepped into this room is in the right place with Jesus. And I do thank you, Lord God. I bless your most holy name, Father, because while you will pour out your wrath and judgment, oh, we will be in the sweet arms of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your promises. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.